Okay. My name is Samantha Washburn Baroni. I am the Deputy Director of the Office of Economic Empowerment. Um, and I am here to welcome you this morning to our Money Experience and Community Colleges kickoff webinar. Um, we, this is a new partnership offered by the State Treasurer's Office, and I'm excited to tell you a little bit about it today. Um, so we will um, start off with introductions. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the Office of Economic Empowerment and why we are doing this type of work. And then I'm going to pass it off to Dave Kaufman. He is the Government Affairs Director at the Massachusetts Association of Community Colleges. And then we will turn it over to Money Experience and they're going to give a nice overview of what Money Experience does, who they are, and what, it, what you can do with Money Experience at your college. Um, and then we'll save some time for Q&A at the end. Um, there is a chat box and a Q&A box, so feel free to pop in questions throughout the presentation there this morning. We'll be monitoring the chat box throughout the event, and if there's any time to um, answer questions in between slides, um, I'll pop on to ask those of, of um, Dave and Zoe and Tim. Um, or if you'd like to just save those for the end, that's absolutely fine. You can also reach out to us via email anytime if something comes up after the webinar or something that's a, you know might might require a few more um, a few more than a few minutes answer. But we're um, very excited to join all of you today and tell you a little bit more about this partnership. Um, so just an introduction of who the Office of Economic Empowerment is. We are an office in the Massachusetts State Treasury. Um, so we were founded by State Treasurer Deborah Goldberg. And our purpose is to um, advocate and facilitate and deliver programs that empower all residents of Massachusetts, particularly to encourage people to learn about ways that they can make sound personal financial decisions um, our initiatives are around financial education. They're around closing the gender and wage gap, racial equity, college affordability, and promoting STEM education. Um, one of our programs that you may have heard of is our Baby Step Savings Plan program, where we give every baby born in Massachusetts $50 to start saving for um, their future, whether that be um, a trade school, any, any college, anything along those lines, and we pair it with financial education. We also offer a number of different digital and um, when before 2020 in-person um, financial education workshops, um, and we've had some sustained partnerships with the community colleges throughout the years. And, but this is a brand new one that we're really excited to offer um, that, you know, is, is digital facing, um, but is super engaging and, and we're excited to make this make this happen and look at this partnership a little bit more today. Before I pass it over to, um, to Dave to just give a few words about the community colleges, I wanted to just show you this screen. So if you haven't already done so in your college that you are representing today would like to request licenses, um, for um, money experience, you just have to fill out this simple form that's on the mass.gov website. Um, and we can put that into the chat today so it'll be easy for you to find. And just fill out the information here. Um, make sure you know all these are mandatory in order to submit it. Um, and we, we did put an, um, a limit on the number of licenses each college could request. But if you go through those licenses or if you need more licenses, we can um, absolutely work with you um, to make sure that we're meeting, um, meeting the needs of each college um, within the, the scope of how many licenses that we have available to us currently. So with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to pass it over for Dave for a few welcome remarks from the colleges. And um, I'll be popping in here and there to, um, to share some of your questions today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Samantha. And I can't tell you enough what, again, uh, how excited I know I am uh, at the community colleges uh, um, about this partnership, specifically with Money Experience and the Office of Economic Empowerment at the treasurer's office has been uh, phenomenal partners for many years now. But uh, for quickly, just for introductions, I'm Dave Kaufman. I, just, as Samantha mentioned, I'm the government affairs director at MAC, the Association of Community Colleges, which works uh, predominantly on behalf of the 15 community college presidents. 
Um, and, and what is really exciting about this uh, partnership again, is this tool, which we know there's there's no silver bullet when it comes to uh, either financial literacy or, but at the same time, this is an incredible tool that is really uh, cutting edge. It's gonna be such an important uh, option for uh, many of our students and prospective students. And what, one thing that I think it was very clear when we first had these conversations with both Money Experience and the treasurer's office is, I think this is gonna make it very clear of the great value that community college education is for a lot of individuals as they think about um, get, getting their college education for the uh, for an affordable price, getting a high quality education, really and having a lot of opportunities, either going right into the workforce or certainly onto transfer to a four-year institution. So it's something I'm really excited about. Um, I'm just gonna just say that and, and really move on to some of the experts, both Zoe and Tim at Money Experience. Uh, they're gonna go over a lot of more of the details and probably ask some of the questions. But again, this is a free tool that's gonna be great to use these licenses for our students. So I, I can't be uh, even more appreciative to both Money Experience for, for offering this, as well as the Treasurer's Office and the Office of Economic Empowerment. We're really trying to leverage this to, to, to fit a lot of our shared goals uh, to, to really helping students. So thank you. And let me pass it over to Zoe and Tim. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, it is always super exciting to hear that people like our program. We love it. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's great to have it out there and be able to deploy in this setting in Massachusetts. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. So hopefully all of you can see that now. Um, I'm just going to give a quick introduction to Money Experience. Um, I'm the head of marketing here at Money Experience, um, and I've been with the company since our inception. Um, I wear a lot of different hats, actually, so I'm a former educator. I'm really involved in some of the product and curriculum um, and uh, definitely a lot of other uh, types of partnership management, things like that. So um, I'm here for any questions that you might have, as well as my colleague, Tim Cluley, who's from our customer success team here. Um, so I'm just going to dive right in. Um, so today we're just going to go over a brief introduction of the program. Um, so just, you know, who we are, the basics of what we do. Um, I'm going to play a short video as well. Um, so we're going to um, just go through an intro. That way you can see a few visuals from the program and get a sense of the look and feel of it. It's super engaging um, and very visually pleasing. So uh, it's kind of a cool thing to include. And if you've seen the video before, I apologize. Um, it is short though, so we'll just go through it quickly. Um, then I'll hand things over to Tim, um, who's going to talk about our customer success team. Um, so our customer success team is here to help with all the different elements of implementation. Um, and they can also support with onboarding. Um, he's going to go over some of the online resources that are available to help with onboarding if you decide to implement the program, as well as the different implementation models. Um, and then finally, he'll go over some of the online resources that we have available in the client dashboard to support you as you're running the program. Um, and then finally, we'll wrap up with a Q&A, as Sam mentioned. Um, feel free to drop questions in before that, though. So at Money Experience, um, we are a Boston-based company. Um, we started with the mission to make personal finance education relevant, engaging, and accessible to all. Um, and what I mean by that is that we felt that some programs can be a little bit prescriptive um, or they can assume a certain background or level of privilege or access um, that we didn't want to assume. Um, and then also they can be a little bit occasionally dry, we know. So we wanted something that felt really personal, really individualized and was really applicable to anybody. Um, and that also started all of our participants on equal footing so that they could explore different opportunities. Um, so we do this by focusing on personal priorities and quality of life um, in an engaging life simulator and a graphic novel. So you'll see a little bit of that in the video that I'm about to play. Um, and then one other important element that we, we do is that we're not a math heavy program. So we want to be accessible to all types of learners. Um, and my firm belief, at least, is that you don't have to be good at math to be good at money. Um, so it's something that allows people of all different, you know, abilities um, in, in that respect to come in, figure it out, um, go through the life simulator and, you know, we're, we're doing all the calculations on the side of the screen for you. Um, so it can be really helpful. And then if you are really good at that, there's, you know, exercises that you can do um, to that end. So I'll just jump right into the video now and please let me know. Um, hopefully you'll be able to hear correctly. 
um, and it'll just be short. So um, hang tight with me and, and we'll watch this together. Welcome to Money Experience. Our software helps you understand how money works in life and how your decisions can affect your financial well-being. Unlike many other approaches to teaching financial literacy, we focus not only on financial goals, but on your priorities in life and how the many decisions you will make over time, from education to career choices, lifestyle and family, saving and investment, all play an important role in achieving your financial and personal goals. A fun and thought-provoking simulator allows you to make choices throughout an entire life arc. What will you study? Where do you want to work? How about housing, vacations, dating, marriage, and kids are all part of the mix. Make your own choices and we'll show you what the outcomes may be. Sometimes financial success does not equate with happiness. It all depends on what's most important to you. Money experience doesn't tell you what to do, but shows you how your own decisions might play out. Unlike real life, we let you redo specific phases of your simulated life or the whole thing. If it doesn't turn out how you had hoped the first time, you'll be helped along in our chat interface by our friendly guide Tess, and you'll meet a motley cast of characters in our graphic novel who will age, learn, and experience life along with you. Whose decisions would you emulate? Whose would you not? There are no right answers, just your own personal decisions to make. Money experience is being used by high schools, colleges, nonprofits, financial institutions, and employers to teach the most important concepts about money and finances to people they are responsible for. Money experience can be offered as an online resource to one-on-one -on -one advising sessions or as a class or workshop. We help teachers and instructors or counselors and advisors get up to speed within hours and in their own time and entirely online. Insightful reports let instructors, advisors, and sponsors get a real-time sense of how their audiences are progressing. What choices are they making? How are things working out? What did others do? All of this provides a rich background on which to begin an important conversation about life, priorities, and better decision-making. So whether you're looking to engage Gen Z, earn millennials trust, or guide employees towards better decision making, Money Experience can help you get there. Start the journey now. Awesome. Thank you so much for going through that with me. Obviously, there's a ton to unpack there. Um, and really, as you start to get into the course um, and our various implementation methods and curricula, um, you'll start to be able to wrap your head around how it all comes together. Um, but you know, most importantly, the basis of it is this really engaging life simulator in the graphic novel. Um, we definitely try to put a lot of emotional context around financial decisions, highlight the fact that you're not making a lot of these decisions and avoid, um, and just get into you know, why it matters. So um, here we go. That brings me to my next slide, which is, you know, where do we where do we begin financial education? And this is something that we put actually years of research into before we built the simulator. Um, we we found that a lot of other programs um, highlight or start with the what uh, with the how. So how do I implement my financial decision? Um, so this means that um, you know there's a lot of product pushing initially, or you're going right into like, okay, how do I fill out a mortgage application? But what we're not talking about is, you know, why should I care about this? When does it matter? And what are my choices? So we, again, want to avoid being prescriptive there. Um, and we want to make sure that we're talking about um, why this matters to you as an individual, when it matters. So for example, a Gen Zer might not be while they're in community college filling out a mortgage application, but 10 years down the line, they might be wanting to think about how to get themselves in a good place to do that. Um, and then we want to go through what their choices are. So I think Dave highlighted this really well um, when he touched on, you know, we, we do really emphasize community colleges in an interesting way. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we have people go through and make different decisions. You can select different types of colleges to go to. Um, and then we can show how that investment plays out over time, how your student loans play out over time. Um, so we do see a lot of students kind of being like, oh, actually, you know, community college is a really good idea. So um, two last slides before I hand things over to Tim. Um, 
just what we talk about. So these are some of the big financial concepts that we go through and I apologize for the sirens in the background. I live next to a hospital. Um, so these are some of the big topics that we go over. Um, we talk about, as I mentioned, paying for college. Um, we talk about banking. We talk about 529s, childcare, healthcare. Um, so as the video mentioned, the graphic novel characters actually age with the participants as they go through the simulator. So they're going through nine phases of life setting their personal priorities at each one. And then we calculate their quality of life by putting those personal priorities together with the decisions that they're making to see if they align. Um, so when you're going through and you're deciding, let's say you say adventure is really important to you in your twenties, and then you spend a lot of your money on luxury goods and instead of travel, we're gonna say, hey, your quality of life is actually a little bit lower right now. Or if you emphasize family later in life and you choose a career where you're not able to spend any time with your family, we're gonna just flag that out. Again, there's no wrong decision. It's just, hey, these two things aren't aligning. So which one of them do we wanna make an adjustment to? Is it that your priority isn't really what you said it was? Or is it that you're not thinking about emphasizing your priority in that decision? All right, so um, finally, I'll just touch on some, um, on some reporting here um, and some impact measuring. Um, so we have a ton of different reports and these are highlighted a little bit in the video, um, but basically we have aggregate reports of all the decisions that your classes will make. Um, so you can see some trends and have some discussion topics around that. Um, so for example, you know, 25% of the class said that they'd like to own a home by age 30, um, something along those lines, and then you can kind of discuss from there. Um, and then we also have um, reports for that built out for education, spending, wealth, career. But most importantly, we have a pre and post survey built in um, to the simulator. So we um, have designed this specifically for money experience. Um, we found that a lot of, um, we actually, there was a research um, study done by the University of Nebraska the year before we started that found that the traditional kind of financial literacy score didn't necessarily tie into um, to changed behavior in the future. So we created our own pre and post survey um, to kind of measure the impact of the program. Um, and what we found um, is that, you know, it's highly effective. The pre and post survey shows the baseline of understanding of big topics like 401ks prior to the program and after the program. So you'll be able to see that. Um, and it also asks a number of questions like how likely are you to start talking to your family about this? How likely are you to talk to your you know, college advisor about this? So it's all built into the reports and it's super interesting. Um, so with that, I'll leave kind of the overview of the program. I'll hand things over to Tim, um, but please, Actually, you know, take this moment um, as we're kind of transitioning, we'll do a few questions um, if you have anything so far. Um, and if not, um, you know, we'll keep plowing through, but please feel free to pop anything into the chat there. Thank you very much, Zoe. I think we're gonna give this a minute here just to see if there's any uh, questions that people have. I don't see any questions popping through, but we can um, give them a few more seconds. Okay. A sign of a, a, of a thorough presentation is no question, so. <laughs> All right, I think we can move on. So I'll pass it over to you. Great, okay, thanks. And uh, during this section, if questions come up, if you wanna interrupt me, that's fine. Um, so um, Zoe, thank you very much. Um, for the, for the quick intro. So I run the, uh, or manage the sales and customer success teams uh, at Money Experience. I've been with the company for a couple of years. And uh, actually we have a director of customer success. So I wanna just introduce her name because you'll be uh, likely interacting with her as time goes on. Uh, and her name is Beth York. So let me get my screen share going and share this. All right, so hopefully everybody can see this and I need to just get back to the slide. Make sure I'm on the correct one. Here we go. Okay, so I wanna talk about customer success. Um, don't feel like you're gonna to have to memorize everything as we go. We've really tried to design our deployment methods so that they're pretty much self-serve. So the goal today is really just to introduce you to um, what you have in terms of assets to help you 
uh, deploy and implement a super successful financial literacy program. Um, so now you have a little more uh, insight into the program. What is it, you know, what does customer success means to you? It really means that we're a partner in deployment. We're always here to provide the tools, resources, and technical support you need to succeed. Um, and so specifically, that means that we're going to be here, move my stuff around a little bit, uh, online resources via our client dashboard, implementation support for self-paced remote classroom or in-classroom deployments, technical support, uh, individual student progress reports, aggregate class reports. So we have a couple of um, primarily two different deployment options. One's called counselor, uh, one's called classrooms. The, the neat thing about them is the implementations can be done on wholly online, completely in person or a hybrid model. Um, it's kind of lucky for us that we, de we designed our platform this way because obviously with the pandemic, it was, um, it was super helpful. And we have a lot of partners that we work with that have you know, started by doing in person and they went to online and they went to hybrid and now they're trying to get back in front of people. So um, we can support any one of those and, and you can kind of mix and match it. Um, pro program access includes optional curriculum, discussion guides. Um, so you can still do independent work, um, but in the classroom approach, the touch points are more frequent to include group discussions and a chapter by chapter approach or focusing in on some key chapters with clear objectives. So we found that the effectiveness of the program um, is enhanced when there's that more of that interaction, which just kind of makes, uh, that makes common sense. So one of the questions we often get asked is how much time is this gonna take uh, both for the people that are gonna be delivering it as well as the students that are gonna be taking it. So I wanna spend a few minutes on this. Um, we've broken it down into the different types of deployment. So for just pre-planning and preparation, and this is the for on the facilitator or teacher side, plan on probably two, two and a half hours um, if you're uh, gonna be doing in the classroom, which means you're preparing for each lesson or chapter individually. It takes just 15 or 20 minutes each, but that, that adds up over, over the time. Um, counselor is less time. You're typically just gonna be interacting with your cohort three times, 20 minutes a piece. Um, so you've got some, some prep for that. Um, in the actual deployment classroom, you're gonna be looking at anywhere from three to eight hours, depending on um, some facilitators will group a few chapters together. Other ones will do one per chapter. And it's also a matter of how much discussion you wanna inter, um, intersperse with the actual uh, program discussion. Um, and then counselor is typically 45 minutes. You're just talking about 15 minutes per kind of setting things up and maybe at the beginning of the program, somewhere in the middle for a check-in and then a wrap-up session. Um, in terms of duration of the program, classroom is pretty flexible. Again, you could do one class per week in a chapter and have it run eight or nine weeks. You could do multiple uh, classes per week dedicated to this, or you could do classes with two or three chapters. So in general, we see it takes about four to eight weeks elapsed time to go through a classroom deployment. And then counselor, um, that's usually gonna be shorter. Again, it's really flexible about how often you want to have those meetings and how much space in between them. And we see that happen anywhere over one to four weeks. And then, you know, similar for the student, um, to, to run through the, um, the simulator, if we just handed out a login and what you saw in the video had a student login, it's generally gonna take a, a couple of hours to them, them to go through it end to end. Um, the counselor sessions on their side, they obviously don't need to do as much prep work, they have to go through it. But in the classroom, they're gonna be dedicating basically the same amount of time that the facilitator would or the counselor. So three to eight hours for classroom, 45 minutes for counselor. Um, and again, identical in terms of the runtime, it's four to eight weeks for classroom and one to four. Um, okay. So online resources. Um, we have a full suite of online resources that can be accessed um, at admin.moneyexperience.com. This is where you and your teachers and facilitators will access the money experience curriculum and simulator, manage the deployment by creating classes and generating student logins, plus monitoring progress and accessing the reporting that Zoe had spoken about earlier. To access the tools and resources, we invite the program administrator, and there'll typically be one administrator for each community college to the dashboard slash admin portal. There, the administrator can add other users. 
those users have different permissions. So we're gonna take a look at those rules and how they're related. So we've set up a hierarchical, hierarchical excuse me, um, uh, approach to the client dashboard. So the program admin who sits at the top, there'll typically be one admin um, at, at each community college. They can add additional admins. They can create organizations, uh, add facilitators, create classes and see all reports for the organizations or classes. So in other words, they can see and, and see the reporting for everything that's below them uh, in the hierarchy. Uh, program admin can see all of the organizations. An organization admin can add multiple users within their org and only see the classes within its own organization. Teachers down below at the bottom or facilitators can create classes and have access to all the reports. So you can see an example here where a college may be deploying the platform you know, through a specific class in the economics department. They may also be um, offering it through the career center or through the first year program, whatever it might be. Those are all considered organizations. They can each have their own admin. It could be the same admin for both of those. Uh, and then the teachers will be down below those. And then you can see here, it's just a, uh, one of the screens here. When, you're, when, when the admin is adding someone, they'll just say if they are organizational admin, if they're a viewer or if they're a facilitator and by uh, calling them one or the other, that'll set up all the permissions automatically within the platform. Okay. Um, by clicking on resources in the client dashboard, you will be presented with implementation and training materials for each type of deployment along with enrollment packages for each. Within each style, you would have access to the full curriculum and lessons plans by chapter. I think this is, this is super important. Um, and one of the things that we sometimes don't, don't stress enough, but um, it's kind of scary to teach financial literacy the first time. A lot of people feel like, I don't know how financially literate I am, or you know, as we were talking about earlier, am I a math whiz? Um, we don't believe you need to be a math whiz. We want anybody to be able to um, facilitate this. And the programs really are the, uh, the materials here really do that. They're gonna, they're gonna queue up the key points that you wanna be making, things to help to drive the discussion, how you can kind of introduce it to each of the students. And um, so we find that this, this is really um, you know, heavily relied upon by our, by our partners. So to gain a better understanding of how Money Experience conducts a, se uh, a session for any chapter, we've been, we've, what we found is most effective is our videos. So we did short one to two minute video in introductions uh, for each chapter that summarized the lesson, lesson's objectives with key takeaways from each lesson. We have also recorded a full classroom uh, session for all chapters to illustrate how we present financial topics in classroom exercises discussion. So in other words, before your facilitator gets in front of the students for the first time, they can actually go through and see how it looks when, you know, when someone else does this and, and then you know, just use their own style to do it the best way that they'd like. In addition to the curriculum materials, we have helpful how-to videos to walk you through step-by-step -step how to use the client dashboard. So we wanna really help you in terms of your doing your deployment. We also wanna help you navigate through all of the content and all of the assets that we're making available to you. Uh, for example, how to add new users, assign user roles, create classes, generate student logins, um, keep track of um, you know, people's progress through the program, all that sort of stuff is there. And we have uh, uh, all the instructions there on how to, how to access that information. And then the facilitator or teacher will also have access to the same simulator that your students do by the client dashboard. That means you have the curriculum, back-end tools to create classes and step through the simulator in one place. And by the way, I think that's really important. Um, going through the simulator, and even if the teacher doesn't go all the way through it, but if they go through the first three chapters, they're really gonna get the feel for what the students are experiencing as they go through it. So uh, we definitely recommend that in terms of their, their ongoing effectiveness as facilitators. And then you're also, if you wanna go through the whole thing is great because then you start to see the big life choices um, that occur at each chapter and the numerous financial decisions that fall into the arc of the story. So you just going through, it just makes you start to internalize it more and therefore be more effective when you're talking about it with others. 
Tim, can I just pause you right there? Because we did have a question come through and it yes. seems timely to what you were just discussing. Would the preferred model being someone at the college is the lead administrator and then adds other users to the system as appropriate, or would only one license be needed in that scenario? So you need a so so the administrators each need a license, and we have admin licenses, and those are set up so that the permissions that they have depend on where they are, if they're the overall administrator for the college versus a certain level, and then each student will need their own license, and they'll log in with those. Is that and I'll jump in there and say I'll, each facilitator will have one as well. So yeah, yes. the admin would add the facilitator, and each person would have their own license and access to the client dashboard. Great, and if any other questions relating to that come through, just pop them into the chat box and I can pause and we can talk about that a little bit more. Great, thank, thank you, Sam. Um, so the client dashboard is also the place where you can access reports and check on student progress. Uh, what percentage of the students got married, how many kids, loan debt reports provide insight into goals and decisions of the class. Report topics include education, spending, wealth, career, home, savings, et cetera. Uh, note, only the OEE and individual colleges will access their, their user report. So again, it's, it's set up with the hierarchy and the permissions. But this information is, um, when we look at feedback, we do case studies, and, uh, and Zoe's really driven a lot of this. I mean, the, I think it's the interaction and the discussions that happen that are, that are just as important as the kind of, you know, I went through the simulator and here was my outcome. But um, the observations about what young people are thinking, what their future, how they're visualizing their own future, and you know all the different paths they're taking is uh, is really really interesting. So that's a that's a, um, a really rich part of the um, of the information that comes out from the program. Tim, we have one other question that just came through. How many administrators do you recommend per campus? For example, one in careers, one in advisor, maybe someone from student accounts or financial aid, or is it better to just have one point person who then adds their own admins? So, uh, and I'll, I'll ask Zoe to jump in after, but my, my I think it depends on, on how you want to deploy it. So there might be a community college that, you know, they're, they're only going to deploy it through the career center and they probably just need one admin for that. But there's other ones. I mean, we had a deployment at uh, Bridgewater State University where they have a financial literacy professor and they actually um, did that through her class and she was the administrator for it. Um, you might have one in the financial aid. So I think it really, there's no right, there's no right or wrong. You should have an administrator for each of the kind of the vertical um, audiences that you're targeting. And it's also okay if an administrator is um, you know, serves a couple roles. For some reason, they might they might be a first year program as well as the career center. So that's that's fine too. But I, but keeping the program separate is good, um, so that you can look at the reporting at that level and then still roll it up to the overall um, the college. Zoe, anything to add there? No, I think that makes sense. Um, I think you know we we having one overarching admin at your college to organize the whole program and give out facilitator licenses definitely makes sense. Um, but you know, you may, there's a couple of different ways that you may wanna do it. You might wanna have um, some of your, um, some availability off of your financial aid offices website um, and have someone there, you know, be an admin um, or just a facilitator um, who can just see that class and that group of students going through. You may want to do it in a counselor setting, in which case that person can just be a facilitator and you can still have that one ownership um, admin at the, at the college level. So there's a few different ways you can do it. And you can also, um, and I think this is important to highlight, add view only admins. So if you have um, someone at your college who's higher level, um, who won't actually be editing the program, but wants access to the reporting and to know what's going on with the program and how effective it is, you can add them that way. Um, so there's a, a couple of different ways that you can do it, um, but really it's whatever works best and the and whatever is, you know, however you're implementing it. And, and Beth um, and Tim will actually help you kind of decide that structure. They can help you identify the way that it's going to work best at your college and kind of show, um, you know, the admin structure that's going to work best in that situation. Yeah, good, good question. Sam, are there any other questions? None other right now. Cool. Okay. That actually is a nice lead into the next slide. So getting started, how will, how, you know, how will this start? Um, 
So the first step is going to be to designate your program admin. This is the you know the top person at the college, uh, and to give provide that email address to us. We'll use that email to invite the um, program admin to the dashboard, review resources and tools. And then really importantly, we've designed this so that it's pretty much self-serve if you want to do it that way and kind of explore and find your way around. But we are absolutely available um, if you'd like to get a schedule one-on-one, -on -one, which is why I wanted to make sure we had Beth York's name out there today. Um, so you'll be able to, to do that. And then that's where we would have the discussions that, uh, that Zoe was alluding to and kind of, you know, what is it you're trying to do? Uh, and what do we recommend, you know, based on our experience uh, and, and how to do that? Okay. I think that's it. If there, unless there's more questions and answer, we can we can open it up. Okay, we have one question. If every user, admin, facilitator, student needs a separate license, about how many licenses would it take to implement this college-wide? Um, it was mentioned that we only have access to a certain number of licenses statewide. Um, I think that that would also depend on the number of students that are at a, uh, at a college as well. Um, but we do have a cap number of 5,000 licenses for the program right now. Um, but depending on funding, that could be expanded in the future. So, and I'll let Tim answer, answer that question in more detail as well. Yeah, there, I mean, obviously there's no right or wrong. Um, some schools are, are, um, are gonna, or, you know, that we've worked with wanna offer it to all of their incoming freshmen. Um, some are offering it, you know, to everybody, just want to make it available, you know, to anybody that wants to come in and grab it. So um, I think the, I think the way that I would approach it is, you know, we know what this, hopefully you're getting a better idea of what it does. And I think going back and just thinking about for your school, where would you, who would you like to be having it? And then that number may not match what's available, but I think it's important to understand it. And then if we, you know, you're starting with, I think with the limit of 250, you can prioritize and then, um, you know, go back and talk to Sam. If it turns out you need more that, I guess it's a discussion that you can, you can have down the road, I would think. Yeah, that was another question that just came through. Is there an option to get additional student licenses in the future? The answer to that is absolutely. We started with a lower number um, just so that we, um, would have a sense, be able to spread it to as many people as possible, as many colleges as possible with the limited numbers that we were able to get at the beginning. Um, but if you need more, talk to me now and I can see if there's, if we can figure that out. Um, you know, we, we anticipate that some colleges are going to find that this will be a really good fit for their, for their students, but the other colleges might not think it's the best fit for them, which is totally okay. We anticipated that to happen. So I think we should be able to be, um, as flexible as possible. Um, and then as far as the duration of the license, so the licenses, as soon as you request them and we get you set up, that's when it will, they'll start for you. And um, I believe that they just have to be um, completed by the end of May of next year. So about one year. Um, yeah, and I'll jump in there and say when the students actually log in for the first time, their license will be active for one year. Um, so they'll be able to go through it again in the future. And we actually weirdly see a lot of students who go back through the program and, and redo it um, as they're thinking about career decisions, things like that. Great. Um, so as far as the setup and uh, how long the setup and onboarding will take, um, uh, I, Tim I, or Zoe, I don't know if one of you can answer the question of how long it typically takes to get someone all set up. but. Once we receive a request, um, we will send it over to Money Experience. And I think pretty immediately, you'll probably hear from someone on the Money Experience team to get you all set up on that. And um, so probably I would say a couple of weeks to get your, um, your portal set up. Does that correct, Zoe? Yeah, that is. Um, and it, it really depends on, you know, actually on, on you a little bit. Um, so we can get, we've had people up and running actually in 48 hours before. Um, when they were really driven and really wanted to get the program off the ground. Um, you know, you can also go through uh, the videos in more detail, uh, meet with Beth or Tim, something like that. Take a couple weeks to get things up and running if you want to be really comfortable uh, with the material first. Um, but we're, I mean, we're here to support any implementation. So 
um, you know, tons of, of resources already available to you online. Um, and then uh, it's just a matter of, yeah, a couple of days or a couple of weeks, depending on the person. Yeah, I would say that um, we have done emergency turnarounds uh, mm -hmm. on occasion, like next day. So if, if there's a reason why, you know, it's, it's got to get started right away, we're, we try to be as flexible and nimble as possible. So the, you know, having a week or two is good to make sure everything's set up right, but we can scramble if we need to. And then will there, there's a question that came through about additional licenses each year for new students. Right now, this is a limited program that we're offering um, through the end of 2022. Um, we're a state office, so all of our um, budgeting and um, is based on the state budget, just like um, all of the colleges. So I'm sure you all understand that. Um, but we are, what's unique about our office is we do have a 501c3 attached to it. So we are looking for additional funding um, opportunities to try to extend this beyond um, beyond this limited um, offering. Um, and, you know, I think that there are so many other, other things we can talk about in that regard as well um, as the program progresses. Um, excuse me, another question that came through was about the estimated time commitment for administering this platform. That is one question that um, I think is, you know, I know Tim went into a lot of detail about the different um, ways that, you um, faculty and staff can administer this program on campus. One question that I, I think has come up a few times when talking about this is say a, say a campus just wants to administer the um, simulator and not spend too much time on the classroom. Is that possible, Tim and Zoe? What would that look like? Yeah, it is, it is possible. And, um, you know, you can do so I'll go back, we were talking about this at the beginning. So another way of doing this, so there's classroom and counselor, which we spent a lot of time on today. We also have self-paced. So typically self-paced is going to be when you wanna have you know, licenses available for someone to come up maybe on the financial aid website and just go self-serve and, and do it themselves. Um, couple comments on this. People tend to not do that very often. If you think about you know, a college kid and everything they've got going on, uh, trying to have um, you know, them voluntarily go in and seek this out and want to go through it um, is, you know, not going to happen all that often. Um, we find that it's super effective when you're somewhat of a captive audience because you're in a class or another, you know, identified group, first year student program or whatever. And then the other part of it is it's just more effective. Um, if you can do it in a group setting, it's just going to work better. If you're concerned about the time investment, counselor is easier than classroom, uh, takes less, and you can really you know, you can slim that down to be a couple of counselor sessions, one beginning, one of end. We kind of like one in the middle, but um, so again, it's super flexible. And um, we, that's, that's, that's what we'll do. It's, we love to have those conversations. You're like, all right, here's our situation. Here's the challenges. What do you guys recommend? We can, you know, we, we solve these all the time. Great. One thing I would add there too is that, um, you know, if you do want to have more of a self-paced version, um, but also have that accountability is it can be a homework assignment too. Um, so we see a lot of people actually, um, you know, assign it as, as homework. So it's not something that you're dedicating class time to necessarily, but you're saying, hey, as, you know, as part of this, why don't you go through many experience or as a counseling assignment, if you're doing some career readiness, things like that. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of get that accountability without having to put the class time dedicated to it because um, it's quite flexible, as Tim said. Sounds great. Um, so one other question, can licenses be recycled if the user stops using? Um, that's a great question. So if someone you know, is assigned a license and they log on for five minutes and then never used again, what happens in that situation? Yeah, they actually don't get recycled once the person logs on and begins the program, um, because then it's 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 basically tied to their unique identification, which would typically be their like you know student email. Um, so we don't, unfortunately, we, we don't reuse them. Great. Um, and then a question just came through: Would it be possible to get a few licenses for staff to try out to see what we think before we decide to try rolling out with students? Um, that's totally fine with me, but I'll, I'll um, make sure that Tim and Zoe are okay with that too. To yeah, I mean, it comes out of your bucket, yep. Pam. So yeah, absolutely. You guys are, are welcome to do that. We also would encourage you to, um, if you're going to do that, to have, you know, if you've got um, kids in your family that are around this age or friends and family, um, having people of that college age, if you're going to, you know, just kind of test it out, a, a dry run would be, would be really helpful. 
And then we yeah. also have, Zoe, it might be helpful to share our case studies if they wanna see, you know, we've got a lot of um, evidence, you know, of the effectiveness of the programs and how the kids like them. So that might be something we could share as well. Yeah, that's definitely something we can share. And I'd say um, you can feel free to just reach out to us either through Sam or, um, or you know, directly at Money Experience to get those case studies. Um, we'd be more than happy to share those. I actually just put together one this month, um, kind of as a celebration of Financial Literacy Month with uh, 800 of our participants from this past year. Um, and we're just really excited by the data. So I'd, I'd love to share that out. Awesome. Yeah, and we'll, we can send that out to, um, to all the participants from um, today, all the attendees today, and, um, and Dave might be able to share it with other colleges as well. But I am just going to drop my email address in the chat. So if you have any other specific questions like that, feel free to reach out to me and, um, and we can um, figure something like that out. But that's a great question. Sam, I actually have a question for you. Um, that they may they didn't ask but they might be interested are you going to um is it like first come first serve with the colleges or how are you handling that yeah so it's first come first serve and um i you know we we, we did discuss with um with dave and the team over at macc is that we expect that there might be a little bit of a um a flux during the summer of interest in the beginning of next school year so um, so we're going to pace it as much as possible. So if possible, just don't, don't request 5,000 licenses at once. But I think that we, well, we can definitely, um, it's, it, we're, once they're gone right now, they're gone unless we're able to receive additional funding to purchase some more licenses. So, um, but I think that five, you know, in, in our experience of a similar program we did that with the colleges a couple of years ago, that seemed like a good number to start with. And, um, and we can kind of go from there. Cool. Awesome. Does anyone else have any questions? Feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A box. Okay, hearing none, I'm going to um, just say thank you to everyone. Thank you to Tim and Zoe and Dave for joining us today. Um, thank you to Eli from our team who is on the back end um, helping managing the um, chat and Q&A box. Um, and we will be sending out some additional information, but if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to reach out to myself, um, Zoe, Tim, anyone at the Money Experience team, or to Dave. Um, we're here to help you um, move this program along. We're really, really excited. We do a lot of um, work in the digital financial education world here at the Office of Economic Empowerment, but there's no program like Money Experience. It's, it's really, really cool once you, um, once you get into it. So. Um, with that, um, I will close us up for the day. All right. Thank you so much. Bye.